Hey everyone, so this is everything I read between the months of October through to the end of December. As always, I've put chapter headings so you can skip around, but why would you do that? Watch all of it. First up, further doings of Millie Molly Manny. No, don't skip ahead. A good book is a good book regardless of who it's supposedly aimed at. This is the third book involving Millie Molly Mandy. It's basically a bunch of separate stories about a girl who's around age six and some of her friends. They live in a country village in the UK and the stories are quite simple ones of children discovering the world that they're in and new experiences like riding bikes and camping in the backyard. People may think the stories are unrealistically nice and I think, so what? They're stories that make you inspired about life and doing exciting new things. There are some great stories in here. In one, Millie Molly Mandy gets to go on a picnic and she gets to go in a car, which is very fancy. And they come across a stranded bus that has broken down. And there's this great scene where everyone's standing around kind of looking at each other, including the grown-ups, but all the kids are kind of looking around at each other, wondering what to do and all too embarrassed to make the first move. It just captures the scene so beautifully. And then in the end, it's resolved by all these kids getting on this car. So there's about 16 kids on the car and some of them are tied on with string. Another example is the fun the kids have when they discover some rusty old bikes in a shed and they learn to ride, even though they've got no tires, they're just riding on the rims. And the author's quite the artist. Just have a look at some of these. All these are done by the author, they're just gorgeous. She just manages to capture things in the middle of happening. So I say don't be afraid to seek this out. A good book is a good book regardless of what age it's aimed at. It's just that as an adult you can really appreciate the skill of the author. And if I ever have any grandkids I'll definitely be reading these to them. And yes, it has a map. Check this out. It's a model of clarity. It's clear where everything is and each book has slightly different information because it indicates where certain things happen, which are in no way spoilers. I mean, how spoilery can it be to know in advance that they'll be going camping and where? This is a definite four star from me. All right, The Lost Symbol by Dan Brown. The uh, 670 pages of this cover about six hours of time. It's basically about a kidnapping and Robert Langdon running around Washington DC, following clues, uncovering secrets, and giving lengthy descriptions of buildings. This is cliffhanger stuff as usual. Dan Brown likes to do surprises, but occasionally they do come off as, haha, look how clever I am at toying with you as a reader. But thankfully that's only occasionally. What is fun though, is the stuff that Dan Brown throws out that's actually true. Occasionally he'll reference something and you go and Google it and sure enough, it is some fun obscure fact. And then there's other places where he's a little bit loosey goosey with the facts. But that's always interesting to research as well. Basically, wherever the book says something like, well, this word comes from the Latin, which actually means this, you should take it with a big heap of salt. And the ending gets very wishy-washy with very vague philosophizing. One interesting technical detail, a lot of the book, there are sections from character point of views. And whenever the character is thinking something, those bits of text are put in italics. So there's no extraneous he thought, which is an interesting technique because it really speeds up the pace of the book. In the end with this kind of book, it's all about the rush and wanting to find out the next secret. And some people may be annoyed by that style of writing. It's the kind where the chapter ends and then a picture appeared on the screen and Langdon couldn't believe what he saw. And then the chapter ends. And then a new chapter starts and you have to wait for another chapter or two before you actually find out what appeared on the screen. It's kind of like the Batman TV show from the 60s. Find out next episode, same bat time, same bat channel. All in all, these are popcorn books and I enjoy them. So it's a four star from me. Next up, Beyond the Fall of Night, Sigh. So this is actually two novellas. The first one is the one by Arthur C. Clarke, Against the Fall of Night. And the second one is a sequel by Gregory Benford called Beyond the Fall of Night. Now the novella was turned into a novel, which I read last April, and the novella I read back in 2021. So I gave myself a refresher and reread the novella, which is still a fantastic story. And then we get the sequel. The first few pages seem to be trying very hard to be descriptive and I just found them annoying. It's not a good start. It's a bit mysterious what's going on, but everything becomes clear at the end of the second chapter and you find out how it ties into the original story. Occasionally the writing is straightforward, but then a few pages later, the purple prose starts up again. It's just bad. 
Chapter after chapter is spent describing these weird space-going animal things and it just makes no sense. It bears such little relation to the original that I'm surprised Clark let it be published. And funnily enough, in the foreword, he mentions that he was actually approached by someone else to do a sequel, but he'd already said yes to Gregory Benford. Maybe that one might have been better. Look, I could go into all sorts of detail, but I'm not going to waste your time. Just trust me, it's bad. I don't understand how so many words can be used to say absolutely nothing. This is a one-star book. But read the original. On to something better, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabriel Zevin. I love this book. In one sentence, it's about two childhood friends that build a computer game company. And while yes, it's about a computer game company, it's really about the relationships of the people involved. In some ways, this is really a fictionalized version of Masters of Doom, if you know that book. That is about the history of id Software, John Carmack and John Romero, and their relationship going up and down. That is a fantastic book. You should definitely read that. But uh, this is quite similar to that, actually. The characters are all very well drawn, they're all distinctive, and they all have varied backgrounds. The way the story is told is very interesting as well. There are quite a lot of flashbacks. The first 70 pages itself is one chapter, and it's really the kind of origin story of the two children, the two main characters, and how they develop their friendship. A few minor downsides for me. There's one character that's pretty awful and there were some story elements concerning them that I didn't enjoy reading about. I won't go into details, I'll just leave it at that. There's also casual sex and drug use, which I'm not down with. Just thought I'd mention it. Uh, if you're averse to any vague spoilers, maybe skip ahead 30 seconds. There's an interesting part in the book where it's done in second person writing, which is kind of appropriate for a book about a game company. And there's a later section which is kind of a story set in one of the computer games, which is a cool idea, but I found that that did drag a bit compared to the rest of the book. And one minor thing, I didn't like how one character treated another character. It was just like, just communicate, guys. I was actually on the fence about this. Was it a four-star book or a five-star book? It's a different type of love story. And I found it very readable. I just wasn't sure if it was five star. It's a great book and four stars is fine, but I'll let you know what sealed the deal for me. It was the last paragraph of the whole book. It made me tear up. And so and that's why I give this book five stars. Next up, The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. That cover is not very attractive. This was Lewis's first non-fiction, non-academic book and it's dedicated to the Inklings. Basically, this deals with the problem, how can an all-powerful, all-loving God allow pain in the world? So I'm not gonna go into details about that and his answer, but suffice it to say, it basically comes down to free will, and although Lewis doesn't use the term free process, i.e. to have free will, you have to live in a world where free will can be exercised. I must admit that sometimes Lewis's writing feels very old school, like having paragraphs that go on for two pages. I'm giving it four stars because I'd like to read it again, but I think other people can probably benefit from other books about the topic. Next up is the second Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. If you only know the movie versions of the Jungle Book, then you probably think this is all about Mowgli and Baloo the Bear, etc., etc. But in actual fact, Probably only four out of the seven stories in the first book are about Mowgli, and in this one, about a little over half. The other stories are only connected in the fact that most of them are in India, and most of them involve animals. The Mowgli stories in this one basically come after the stories in the first Jungle Book, and the last one in this book, he's actually reached the age of 18. This was a slow read for me, but that was caused mostly because I was often looking up things like what does a Himalayan black bear look like? I read the first book three years ago and I can highly recommend it. There wasn't a bad story in the bunch, but this second one is just okay. It's kind of like the B-sides. Yeah, that's showing my age. One odd thing about this is how many these and thous and hests there are, but that doesn't seem consistent from one story to the next. This is just a three star from me. Next up, Of Dice and Men by David Ewalt. This is about the history of D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons. 
It's actually half memoir and half history. The memoir part is actually about the author's experience playing D&D growing up and then rediscovering D&D later on. And that makes this book very accessible because it gives a flavour for what it's like to play D&D. The history part is what I really enjoyed. I already know quite a lot of it, but there were still some details that uh, were new to me. And I think it also handles the conflict between Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson quite well. In a nutshell, 2% inspiration, 98% perspiration. Yes, Dave Arneson came up with quite a lot of the ideas, but it really took Gary Gygax to actually make it all workable and put the work in to get something that could be understood by other people. I've read everything TSR published up to the start and into the first part of first edition, and it's extraordinary how productive Gary Gygax was in those early years. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I wasn't expecting quite so much memoir, and although that was enjoyable, that's what makes this a four-star book for me instead of five stars. I would have liked a bit more history. The last book I read in 2023 was The Dragon Reborn by Robert Jordan, the third book in the Wheel of Time. I am going to have a full review of this book. Suffice it to say, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's still only a four-star book for me. It was really good. Just not sure I can give it five stars, but I am definitely looking forward to reading book number four. So that's what I read in the last three months. Definitely top read was Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them, and I'll see you in the next video. See ya.